talk to Robert Winston about the time that you became champion apprentice uh, in the UK. How did you decide? Because often we hear apprentice jockeys saying, I really w wanted to go for the title. Same with fully fledged jockeys. But how did you decide that that was the right thing to do to just uh, wor don't worry about your claim and just ride as many winners as you can? Um, I think starting off that year, I thought I, I could have a good chance of being champion because I had the experience of a couple of years behind me. And, you know, Richard Stable was growing all the time. I was riding out for Tim East to be at the time as well. And I knew I, had, I was going to have quite a lot of, you know, support from those two, two stables. So do you have to um, tell them? Do you say, listen, I really want to go for it so that they would, they would back you and uh, use you in the right way? No, I think your talent has to shine through, really. Um, right. I think you've got to be able to make the weights turn up, you know, to the races and um, get get the rides. Um, that year I had a good agent as well, R Richard Hale. He's been one of the leading agents for a long yeah. time up the north. And, you know, he, he was very confident that would have a big chance. And, you know, we're out to help and support from the trainers and, and the likes of Richard. I wouldn't have been able to achieve it because, you know, he had the contacts. And... Um, but I worked very hard myself to, to go on and be champion apprentice that year. You know, I sacrificed a lot of things. Like, I, you know, I was, as I was more or less wasting very hard every day just to make the weights for the rides I was getting. And, um, you know, I was riding out six, seven days a week. I was working very hard. Was it worth it? Yes, it was, yeah, def definitely. I was young and hungry and... Um, you know, when I look back, it was you know it's a great achievement. It's there on your record forever, and you know. It's on your CV. They can't yeah. take it away. Mm. Yeah. Who did you beat that year? Who was second? Neil Callum was second that Neil year. Callum. Yeah. Oh, that's even better. Yeah. <laughs> I think I was probably I think I was probably about ten winners behind Neil, coming down to the last five or right. six weeks, and then you got I ended up finishing probably four, I bet, five. I bet he's never one. forgot either. No, he wouldn't. No. no. Yeah. So you said ten, ten behind. How 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 did you you claw that back? I think I had a big advantage over Neil because I was doing lighter weights than Neil at the time. He was he was quite heavy as an apprentice, whereas I would have been as heavy as him. But I think I sort of got knuck knuckled down and I shed that extra few pound <laughs> off just to just to ride the winners, you know. So it really is hunger that wins the title. It, it is indeed. It's like that. Yeah. Well, I'm actually Ma pleased Martin, with that. Yeah. You are really. I'm <laughs> impressed. I'm impressed. But but um, you've you've mentioned it a few times. You've talked about keen to win I wanted to prove you know strongest there there's that sort of focus that you seem to have had is that something that you got naturally something that was instilled in you where did that come from um I think I, naturally I, I was uh, yeah, naturally I was a good horseman and you know I rode a lot of difficult horses out from from when I started with Martin so to riding at Richards and I think um, it's basically how listen and wanting to learn. Even now, I I, I still want to learn and progress and with, with horses and two you know t the two day two the same two days are never the same when it comes to the animals. There's always something you can learn, and it's the same same at race riding. Mm. So after you've won the the title, which you said worth every effort that you made, every sacrifice you made, there's always that difficult period which we all use it's all a cliche in races say oh you know the the transition from apprentice jockey to fully fledged jock is a really difficult time so how did robert winston get through that um yeah well it was a very difficult time obviously you know paul was there with richard coming through and you know i think richard probably only had about 30 horses at the time and by then you know with me being champion apprentice there was a there was a lot of phone calls a lot of apprentices wanted to join the yard and um I kind of just sort of transitioned away because I was getting a lot of support from outside trainers and owners up north. And um, I think it was the year after I was I was champion apprentice. Linda and Jack Ramsden had stopped training, but they returned back to the UK and they, they were setting up training near Torsk. And Kieran again put my name forward because they were looking for a stable jockey. They, do, they just wanted a bit of continuity. Mm. And... Um, I got a phone call from Mr. Ramsden, went over and met himself and Linda, and they, they gave me an opportunity. And I think, I think since I joined Linda Ramsden Stable, um, you know, they were very, very good to me. Jack had sent me to the States, to California, for three months during the winter, and this was after my apprenticeship. And I went and spent three months with Richard Mandela, and just, you know, walking out to do leads and clock timing and I just wanted to learn. I think I, I think looking back, I think I hounded Mr. Mandela. 
every morning. Cause Did you? I, yeah, I just asked questions every every morning. And um, by the time I left there for the three months, uh, you know, if he said if he told me to go around the track in 24 seconds, or you know, every four long, I, I pretty much could get a bang on. You know, so I, I, you know, I worked very hard on that. Do you think that's something that nearly every or every rider should should be capable of, and that something perhaps did you think, they all did it really experience? help you do, doing that? Did. Yeah. Riding in America and learning the clock, as they call it, did it, do you think it helps you? Yeah, it does. Yeah, because you, you get you get used to the speed that you're going, and you know, it's especially in sprint distances. You know, yeah. generally a sprint distance can be running between one ten and you know one twelve. Yeah. One twelve. You, you sound like you you don't think that that's necessary, Martin. No, well, probably because because I never did it, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I, I I I mean, what works for one person doesn't work for the other. But I've never been a big fan of it because racing over here is nothing like racing in America. And um, I think you should know it in your head automatically. You get, I get, rather get the feel for it than try but did and you, count do the you seconds. Do you not think when well, we watch, as racing fans, we watch uh, Steve Cawthon and Gary Stevens come over here, and they they obviously were very good but anyway when they came over. But they they rode races where it seemed as if they caught jockeys napping because of how they were. Yeah, but you should be able to do that naturally without counting the seconds. I don't think Steve Cawthon was brilliant. I mean, slip anchor is per perfect example of what you're saying, but. Lots of other jockeys can do that without, without have ridden in America. That's just my feeling of it. I think you should know, have a feel for mm. what speed you're going, and, and that's just a basic tool of jockeys. Sort of. But yeah, if that helps, a yeah. lot of a lot of jockeys have gone to America. Yeah, done it. Yeah, they have. I mean, with with, with the American jockeys that you know, Kieran did as well, on, didn't Kieran he? Kieran did. Yeah. Yes, I think it, Kieran spent his time at Bobby Frankel. Mm. You know, the late Bobby Frankel. He'd um, got into I, hot water, didn't he? It was it the Webster incident, and then yeah. the, the Ramsden sent him off to to that's America? Right, he did, yeah. yeah, yeah, he did. You know, and I, look, I found I found it a great experience. Not it was not just the clock; it's just the movement of a horse, being able to switch a man and off leads, and you know, you know, shifting them onto a different lead if you need be. Yeah. And I think you can learn hell of a lot. You know, even riding horses here, if you, you know, if you if you have horses that are switching onto the leads and halfway around the bend when they shouldn't be. Yeah. It's not natural for horses to do, and if you know you can, just being to the states, you know, just it does open your eyes, and I, I think it's pretty much the same out in Australia as well. Mm. You know, pretty much similar to America. But, and do you think that the Ramsdens noticed something in you that they also saw in Kieran Fallon? Not you say you you didn't copy Kieran's style, but that focus that I think we've we've kind of seen coming through the focus and determination to to do whatever it takes to win. Yeah, it was, you know, look, listen, you know, obviously Jackie liked to have a punt and with my riding style, he seen that I was able to push hard and, and give it and give it everything when it when it mattered, when it comes down to the war, whether mm. you'd win by an Austral or lose. And, you know, and I think they were, you know, they're very good people. I think they wanted to give me a chance. They knew that I sort of moved away from Richards and, you know, they, they were looking to give somebody young a chance and, mm. you know. It's interesting, they, they kind of chose the same jockeys with a similar style because you were you were always compared to Kieran and Jimmy Fortune as well a mm. real sort of strong from the saddle uh, strong ride and a finish which was your um, trademark wasn't it really yeah yeah and I think that like with the north and the south there is a bit of a divide like down south the jockeys have always been a lot more polished and neater and tidier up north you tend to find that they do ride a little bit deeper and they ride they ride stronger um, yeah but back then, the horses probably wouldn't have been as classy up north as what they were down yeah. south at the time. If you ask a southern jockey, they say more agricultural up there. <laughs> yeah. But do you think yeah. that's true, that jockeys down south have a little bit more polish? I think a little bit. To the, I think it's to do with the tracks. A lot of the tracks up north are very undulating, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they are. You know, I, I mean, as I said, we sort of hitting the point, you know, the, the horses weren't as classier back then, mm. you know, 20 years ago up yeah. north than they were down south and it's, it's all it's racing has changed it's different now there's, there's, the, the class of horses is pretty yeah. much similar all over the country now okay so we're going to take another pause there we're setting up now so you're with the Ramsdens and then you're spreading your wings more and more trainers and more and more success coming your way but back to the studio we're concentrating on chatting away to Robert Winston alongside Martin Dwyer Robert we've got to the stage now where you settled in uh, with Jack and Linda Ram Ramsden, but you're also riding for lots of other people as well. Uh, as the years progress, uh, I think 2004, you start riding lots of good horses, lots of good winners. You won the John Smith's Cup uh, on the grey, 
uh, Carlos, uh, for, for Howard Johnson. Uh, talk us through that, that memory. Um, he's a horse. I think I won him up at air. He was off a relatively low mark. And um, I remember when he won, my, my agent, Richard Hale, said, will, will this horse win the John Smith's Mac in the Cup? And I said, he, he could do if he was well handicapped for it. And um, they specifically laid him out for the race. And um, it was just one of those... Um, Races where I would say it was probably one of my better rides of, of you know. Yeah, you're, you're just in the Graham Wiley colours. Right. You're, you're actually tracking Kieran Fallon Kieran, in the Queen's colours. That's right. Yeah, you know, I was actually drawn 18, so he had an impossible task to get a good position from where he was drawn. I think he ended up on the fence on the rail after about 200 yards. So I got <laughs> into a lovely well position. <laughs> yeah, but um, no, it was a great, it was a great, it was a great day. Martin, we're able to to look at both Kieran's style and Robert's style. Very similar. You got, uh, did you know you're going to win at this point, Kieran? Looks like he's getting away from you. Yeah, I was slowly grinding him in, you know, slowly grinding him in. And I was about around about here now. That was there. Uh, see his horse was tying up, and you know, I, I knew I was always going to get to the, the winning line. And what was that feeling like now? That's just that's a big win, isn't it? That's yeah, a massive win. Yeah, it is. It's, a, it's a, you know, it's a big win. There was there was a lot. There was less racing back then, so it was more publicised all over, and you get you know big you know big highlights the next day in the papers and. No, it was it was a, it was a great day, you know, and, and Marceau was great, you know, riding for Andre and Graham Wiley. They were they were new to race, and, mm. and they, obviously Howard trained all of the horses, and it gave them a great buzz, and they they bought some really nice horses. Then after that again, which obviously I was very lucky to get to keep the rides on. Yeah. But that year, 2004, it was the start when you really started to get on proper good horses, wasn't it? Yes, it was. You know, I think um, I mean, I think that winter. I think I went into Sir Michael Stouts and start riding now for him, you know, late on in the winter, it was probably around about January time yeah. and, you know, then he, I mean, he put me up on the Lincoln winner streams of gold. Before, before we get to, to, the, to the Lincoln winner, because you rode your first Group 1 winner, uh, that's, or 2004, uh, in the Cheveley Park, Magical Romance, a big price, albeit, but you were talking about, you know, the north-south divide, riding for a lot of trainers up in the north, obviously Howard Johnson, uh, yeah. but now you're on a, uh, a southern train uh, runner in Magical Romance uh, in the right. Chigley Park. Yeah, I mean, back then I was, I was riding a few horses for Brian Mayen at the time, and um, I was riding a few winners, especially with these horses he sent up north, and um, I'd ridden Magical Romance to win in a nursery at Leicester. Mm before she actually won the Chibley Park. But unfortunately, Jimmy couldn't ride her that day because Jimmy Fortune was, was stable jockey to yeah. Brian. So when she got declared for the Group 1, it was obvious that Jimmy was going to ride her. He had more experienced jockey, Group 1 winning jockey, and he was Brian's jockey. So Jimmy was jocked up and declared. But unfortunately to Jimmy the day before, he, he had a bit of a fall and a bit of a freak accident, fall in the parade ring at Newmarket, and he hurt himself. and. It was, a, it was a lucky day for me, and I was very lucky and privileged that I got the mm. call up to, to ride her. I mean, she was an outsider. She was a 40 to 1 chance. But um, did anyone think she was going to win on the day? I, I, don't, I don't think they did, because the right. Damson was a, was Damson a strong fan. Kieran, again, yeah. you, got, you got the better Kieran again in all these videos. Yeah, I bet, I bet Kieran's thinking, hey, why did I help this kid? <laughs> yeah. You know, but um, down in the dip, I was giving everything. I got very tight. And, you know, when she was a tough filly, soon she hit the rising ground, she dug deep for me and um, went on to win. It was, mm. it was a big highlight in my career. It was, you know, one of the, one of the highlights it, of all time. Uh, uh, how, how good is it when, that jockey, when a jockey gets that Group 1 win at Underbell? What does it, you know, we talk about it all the time, but what does it really mean? It's so hard to win one, isn't it? Very hard, you know, and, you know, it's, it's, um, it's just breaking the ice, really. It's, it's what, what doors can it open? When you're a young, young jockey, what doors can it open for you? now that you've, you've proven that you can ride a Group 1 winner. But after that, I don't think I rode a Group 1 winner on, up until then Le Breeze a Breeze mm. a couple of seasons ago. So I'd gone, I'd gone a long spell, yeah, long drought before, yeah. before my next Group 1 winner. That's, how, that's what makes them special, because they're just yeah. so hard. It's hard to get rides in a Group 1. Yeah. I mean, uh, as a young it's jockey It's the same people through. riding in it generally. Yeah, yeah. 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 so to win them, it's, it's, a, it's a great achievement, yeah. isn't it? You know, count them your hand, the many seconds in between, but the seconds don't count. You Nobody know, remembers them, do they? Pretty horrible no, day. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Just looking at that. You've still so, got your looks there. That's it. I was a young Who's puppy. on the inside? Is that that's, Philip, that's Philip, Philip Robinson? Robinson? Yeah. And, and, back in, and back and forth? In Kieran, the, I think that looks like John Egan. John Egan, yeah. Kieran Fallon on Damson. Um, and and were, they, were they celebrations? Did you celebrate that, that win on, on 
Yeah, uh, yeah. Back then, it was it was a normal thing. It probably still happens now. There's always a few bottles of bubbly, you know. Yeah. After the group one is bought and sent in for the jockeys and ballots, and you know, it's just a, it's just one of them yeah. celeb celebratory moments. So at this point, have you have you come on Sir Michael Stout's radar to the point where he knows that Robert Winston is the talented jockey and he wants to start a, a relationship going? Um, what happened was um, when it was the old Kempton Turf track, uh, Kieran didn't turn up. He was late from one meeting to another, and he was late getting to Kempton one evening. and was on the turf, as I said, and then um, I got a spare ride and I finished second. And he was very happy with the ride. And I think from there, that's when I started to pick up a few outside simple rides as from him. As simple as that. It's just it's being in the right place at the right time, and you know, it's it's all luck. But it's also taking those opportunities once you yeah. get them, isn't it? And uh, proving your worth, isn't it? Yeah, mm. yeah. Sometimes the door opens, but you've got to be there to take the. You've got to be there to take them, and yeah. you know. And I think, you know, when you, when you get these type of opportunities, it's your sort of chance to shine. And, you know, when trainers give you specific instructions, you've got to abide by them and ride them to the letters. Pretty, as so you must have much. thought, that sort of 2005 then, going into that season, you must have thought, you know, the world, the world is your lobster. You must have thought, here we go, <laughs> rubbing your hands, you're, you know, you're riding for Michael Stout, you've already proven Group 1 winning jockey. Well, how was that yeah. going into to 2005? Um, it was, I think it was the year that Kieran became stable jockey to Aidan O'Brien and the Kilmar team. Right, correct. Yeah. And so there was, there was an opening there, you know, for Sir Michael Stout. Yeah. I think I, would, I think I was captured, the picture taken of me right now on the heat, but I was only there because I put myself in that position. So you, I you went there. to Sir Michael and said, I'll come and ride out I'll for come you? In, yeah, I'll, I'll come in and ride out. And, yeah. you know, and um, I remember streams of gold was entered in the Lincoln and I had yeah. sat on him in a piece of work, yeah. Sir Michael. And um, I was having breakfast with him, and I would not, I would never normally ask for a ride, but I knew we would win the Lincoln. Yeah. How did so you know? How did, did you know? You said be, over because, team toast. Yeah, because he was very well handicapped. For, <laughs> I know he's a group horse going into handicap, yeah. you know. And I asked him, I said, "So, Michael, I'd love to ride streams of gold." And he looked at me with a smile. And he says, well, "If you don't ask, you don't get." They were the words I got from him. He says, <laughs> "Fair play. You can have the ride." You know, and. And um, you know he went down the morning and that was sort. Of, that, I, mean, I think he, that was he, a, he bolted up really in, a, in that Lincoln. Didn't yeah, he? yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, crew horse yeah. and a handicap. Yeah, but still, you know, you still, you still got to ride them with confidence. Go out and drop him in, ride him, you know, yeah. to come home and, and and get them finishing force past the post. Yeah, you know, so you know he went the morning and that was it. I was, I was, I was, I was in demand that year. Yeah. Uh, uh, so you're going. So you're going away now. So you've, you've landed that. There's a there's a building momentum. People are talking about the fact that Kieran's now gone to to Bally Doyle. There's a gap here at Sir Michael Stout's. Robert Winston's won first big race of the season on the turf. So, how is that relationship going? What what is it like? Is this just a, a chat? You're not. There's no formal agreement between. No, there's no no. There was never any formal agreement. We were, you know I was turning up and riding out and. Um, turning up at the races, I was riding the instructions, I was riding winners, had a, you know, had a very good strike rate. Because Mick Cannan Michael. was still the main man he was, he was going to for the, yeah. for the Group 1 races. Yeah, and you know, and so Michael, I mean, he had, you know, I think it was Christophe Soumian had come from France, you know, he still had regular, you know, top race jockeys, you know, riding for him. But, um, but I was given a lot, of, a lot of good opportunities, you know. But you were in a great position, weren't you? Because yeah. you didn't have the pressure as a young jockey riding all the first string, the big races, but mm. you were getting a good supply of, of decent horses to ride. Yeah. You were riding for everybody that year, weren't you? I mean, yeah. that was your, that was when you were, you were clear, weren't you, in, yeah. the, in the jockey's yeah. table at that point, towards the mm. end of the second half of the season, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I think I probably had 10 rides for the Aga Khan that year, and I think about seven of them won. I rode a horse called Lingari to win, you know, he won a handicap yeah. at the Hamilton, it might be in the listed race, but he yeah. went on to be a... Yeah, he was a, a top race horse in Dubai, yeah, wasn't he? Dubai, yeah. Al Shamali and... You know, sounds, you know, the likes of Jeremy, I managed to win on Jeremy, Red Blooms, a lot, a lot. I was very lucky and fortunate to yeah. get the leg up on some very nice Royal horses. Ascot winners that year as well? Yeah, I think it was possibly, was it Master Plaster uh, that, uh, that year? Uh, uh, Master Plaster in yeah. Norfolk, that was, a, that, that was up at York that year. Yeah, yeah. That, that was, yeah, Howard Johnson's, you know, yeah. Graham and Andrea Wiley's, that was, that was a great day and I think we, the year after we won with South Central, he, he yeah. down, down at Royal Alaska, he won the, the Norfolk again. So, so in the summer of 2005, did you think Robert Winston was invincible at that point? I was, was close to your invincibility in your career? 
yeah, I was riding high with confidence. My weight was very, very good. I you know, my, my weight was very stable, probably around about eight stone five, eight mm. stone six. They, they were the weights that I was doing. Um, but I, I was riding a lot of winners. I, there was times I was riding five winners a day, you know. Um, I was I was lying second, four second, quite a long way down with Jamie Spencer throughout the championship. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think it was August when I had the accident. I think it was probably two or three in front of Jamie yeah. when, when, you know, when the accident happened. So everything going swimmingly and you're talking about being in the right place at the right time so often. And then, of course, there's the other side of the coin the wrong place at the wrong time, but it is what it is. Yeah. You are uh, riding Pearl's a singer uh, at air, yeah. and then there's a, an absolutely horrendous fall. Yeah, well, I mean, that evening, you know, I probably, you know, realistically looking back, if it was today and I had the knowledge, I probably would have, you know, probably got off the horse, because I had ridden in the race or two previously, and you know, my horse was slipping on the bend and I wasn't very happy. There was long, lush grass. The horses weren't getting any grip and, um, you know, but at the end of the day, I was leading the championship and I, you know, we did have a course inspection and they carried on with the racing and um, I was in a position where I had to ride, really, because, as I said, I was leading the championship by two and, you know, wow. and um, right. that was it. Which uh, colours are you in here, Bobby? I'm second on, the in, second on the outside, I think. On the outside. and I haven't seen this for a long time. Maybe you don't want to watch it. <laughs> no. Uh, I'm surprised that you agreed to let us show it. But, I mean, <laughs> it's just terrible. Oh. Yeah, so yeah. that's when I got need in the jaw from the horse, you know, from behind. I think I would have got up and walked away only for that, you know, kick into the face. So, if you don't mind, I mean, is it possible at all to, to recollect what is going on in your mind? If there's anything at all other than just complete shock and pain, I'm imagining. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I knew exactly, ev I knew everything what happened. I can remember it to this day. Um, when I went down, I remember I actually hit the ground. When I hit the ground and I started to roll, I thought, right, I knew I was going to be fine. But then once I got that kick, I remember everything, the pain, you know, I knew my teeth were gone, but I knew my jaw, I knew my jaw was one side of my face because I mean, I did have a, an accident a couple of years you know, prior to that where I'd had two plates inserted into my jaw from a kick, you know, in a haydock, two rain snapping race, I come out the back. But I just, I, I just knew I was, in an awful, I was in an awful bad way then. Um, I think I, I read but, somewhere where you said that the pain, you felt like you wanted to die. The pain you know, it was so. like my head was going to explode, yeah. I remember that somebody come to see me at the hospital and, I, you know, I actually wrote out, something a bit of paper just say I, you know tell everybody that I love them I, I don't think I'll survive you know it was it was awful really but um so it felt, when I look, it felt that bad to you you really yeah. thought you were yeah you know but I never really got a chance you know sort of to to look back as you you know I mean but the jockeys that come down that day they they, they were brilliant yeah especially Neil Callum I mean he was the first one on the scene because one of his horses come down I think it was possibly Rice and French um but like, I mean, everybody would they were amazing that day. Um, once I got to one hospital, they had to remove me to another one because they couldn't deal with the with the facial injury. I had to I had to wait 24 hours to have an operation from a specialist. Um, and it was it was awful because obviously with the the morphine I was on, I was I was sick all night. So every time I kept getting sick, my whole my whole jaw kept crunching, and I was you know it was, it was, it was I was I remember awful. seeing something I'd never want to go through again. I remember seeing a picture at the time. Your head actually ballooned, didn't it? The yeah. picture it was a picture yeah. of you in the hospital, and you looked like the elephant man. Your face was massive. Yeah, I mean I don't know where them pictures are gone. Actually, I did send them to people, but you know, was, such I'm a not sure if you want to keep in my wallet. <laughs> yeah, no, no, definitely no. I wouldn't want to look back on it anyway. Yeah. And at what point then did you think about the jockey's title, which unfortunately had slipped from your grasp after that fall? At what point did you start thinking about that, or did that not enter your head? I was just, to be honest, I was uh, I was relieved that I, I was still alive, you know, because um, I don't. I mean, I, I, I don't. I mean, my daughter was just a few months old. I had a young daughter mm. when she's fifteen now, and I, I was just relieved that I was still around to be able to sort of see her growing up, you know puts it into perspective doesn't it when you yeah. have something serious with that because you can break your arm or your leg but when you get a, a, a blow to the head like you did 
I mean, you've seen the, the fall. It was the second bit, wasn't it, with the horse behind? Right, just yeah, it actually yeah. galloped into your face, didn't it? Really? Yeah, yeah, mm. pretty much. You know, and I think from that fall, I mean, I think I sort of suffered, you know, with sort of mental health issues, you know, since then. Um, you know, I never, I never admitted ever, ever having a drug in my life. But when I had, when I had an accident, the Haydock, and um, my face was swelled up, and all the inside of my jaw was cut to shreds. You know, a friend had turned around. And said, I was in a lot of pain. He says, "Put some cocaine in your gums." He says, "You won't feel a thing." I says, "No, I would never do that," and I did, and I never felt any pain. But when I got back riding, I like I stopped it before riding. I never took it to the racetrack. But when the air accident happened, the first thing that came to my head was self-medicate because I was like I was in a, in a lot way in a bad way. And I think I went about a month after the accident, and you know, I had to check myself into to rehab because I was on drugs and wow. drink and you know I, I suffered mentally to, probably to the, to the case where I didn't probably want to come back riding because it was oh. it was so bad you know because people I, wouldn't blame you well I was going to I was going to ask so having had that experience and thinking to yourself look I'm glad to be alive what what's going through your mind and saying you know what I'm glad to be alive but I'm going to press on I'm coming back I was I was young and hungry I, I wanted I, I, I I didn't conquer, finish what I wanted to achieve, you know, and I never managed to do that since then, you know, so that's the most unfortunate thing about it. Let's, let's take a pause there, because it's fascinating. I mean, we could just keep talking and talking and talking, but we've obviously got the racing at Dundalk, uh, but it's a nice juncture. Uh, you're coming back, and we'll pick up your comeback uh, very shortly. <laughs> So you've had the fall, you've gone through an enormous amount of pain, recovery, you talked about addiction, checking yourself into rehab, and you're making your comeback because at the time you felt you had unfinished business. Correct, yes. It was, you know, obviously it was getting that taste of big race success, leading the championship. It's what any jockey aspires to be once they set off with a career. You know, I was champion apprentice, the next step was to be champion jockey. You know, I wanted to ride in Group 1s, the Derbys, the, the Arc de Triumphs, the American Breeders' Cups, you name it. You know, brings sort of back to the day when, when you look at, back at Pil Sudski when Wally Swinburne won the Japan Cup, you know, it's, it's, they, they were the pinnacle hmm. moments, you know, and, and it's, it's what any young jockey aspires to, to be. Yeah, well, Walter Swinburne, obviously, he had that horrible fall in Hong Kong. Mm. Uh, the following year, he came back and he rode Bill Sudski to win the Breeders' Cup turf. I mean, what what was your inspiration? I mean, who did you look to? Who did who did you 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 have conversations with to help you get back uh, riding again? Um, I wouldn't have said I had any conversations to get back riding again. Was this after the accident? It was, to be honest with you, um, it was it was very it was very difficult getting back. You know, the first two or three weeks, you know. I was, I was closing my eyes, going, I was going around Wolverhampton and tracks, I was closing my eyes in some circumstances, you know, and, but I, because I pushed, you because, were yeah, because, afraid? Yeah, yeah, pretty much, yeah, because it was, it was still very raw, I came back four months after I had the accident, it was a very short space of time to come back, you know, I didn't have any platform or grounding to come back, i.e. like treatment, you know, I just got straight back into it, but it was, it was very, very tough. You know, and when you sorry to interrupt, when you say treatment, you mean more mental than physical? Mental, yeah, treatment. mentally, yeah. Pre mentally, I wasn't really wasn't prepared for it. You know, but so your your body was healed, but you mentally you were still a bit scarred, and yeah, so yeah, you found that tough. Yeah, I mean, I, I pushed myself to get back soon. Four months, I probably should have took a year off. Really, when I look back, it was because because the injury was so horrific. Four months with that amount of mental work, I don't think my me, me body was healed and neither was my mental state really. But if you know yourself, if you have so much time out of race and new people jump into your boots and that's... We spoke about this earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what in, happens. In, in the world we live in, you miss out on opportunity, somebody else gets in. That opportunity, you're, you're so afraid that that opportunity will never come back for you, so yeah. you do everything you can. Yeah. push yourself beyond what you really should have done. Yeah, I mean you only have to look at the likes of AP McCoy. He's never been beaten in a championship and he's ridden with facial injuries, broken bones, collarbones, shoulders, you name it. 
and he's pushed himself to the limit. You know, and that's the reason why he ended up being the best that's ever been as a jump jockey. And um, is that know, the right example to set, though? In this day and age, no. You possibly wouldn't. You wouldn't. You wouldn't get away with it nowadays. I don't think. You know, just the medical teams are a lot more stricter nowadays. And if you stood down, even with concu concussion, you stood down for quite a long period now, be a few weeks, I should imagine. Mm. And it'd be like any injury, you're constantly assessed. You know. I think it's probably not the right example to be set, but in a sporting environment like we live and work in, it's you know if you don't ride, you don't earn a living. And you have to push yourself um, forward, don't you? And you push yeah. yourself to come back through injuries too soon. And we've all done now. But it's interesting when you t when you say that, you know, that's quite frightening to think. If you say you came back too soon and mentally you weren't ready for it, if you're going round Wolverhampton with your eyes closed, I mean, what? That sounds really bad. I mean, what yeah. were you thinking of that? Yeah. At that time, were you really that sort yeah. of worried about it happening again or what? It happened again, yeah. And plus, it was you know still four months after you know what. The initial accident and knowing what I'd gone through, you know, thinking if this happened the third time and got another kick in the head, I'd be it. I'd be finished, you know, because your body or your head can only take so many kicks and you know full force Did the doctors kicks. try and stop you? Um, no, because I passed all the fitness mm. and exams. I mean, I worked very hard with my fitness to get back riding and. Um, but you probably never told anyone what you were feeling at the time, no, did you? No, no, because in you know in racing. If people think that your bottle is gone, you're not, you're not, they're not going to put you up. I don't think my bottle was gone. I think I was, I was sort of reliving the accident flashbacks and stuff like that. And over the years, you know, I has, I've gone through, you know, I've gone through that, and I've had therapy for it to try and block it out. But it just seemed to, just has seemed to have come back, you know. So at the time, how were you coping day to day? If you're going to work, worried about what could happen, how were you coping with it? Um, well, we touched on the point with alcohol. I mean, look, I've I went into rehab. I spent eighteen months sober, and um, you know, I, I could, after that, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't maintain it with the way, the travelling, the pressures of the job. Reliving the accident in your mind, like you could be cantering the post, and you get flashbacks, and you know, so I, alcohol was had become a part of my life really, and. You know, unfortunately, it did help to get me through the day to day. Almost dependent. Job. Yeah, I became alcohol dependent. Yeah, you know, and um, it's not that's not a good example because I kept the you know kept the choir kept you know a lot of people didn't know because I'd stopped sort of after a few years of the accident I stopped going out and socialising. People wouldn't think I was having a drink, but I was. I was I was having a drink at home. But at the same time, not only was I taking chances on the racetrack, you know, with injury and stuff like that, you, you, you're slowly killing yourself and, you know, and, and your own health as well is, is at risk. And as a sportsman, what sort of level were you performing to compared to the level that you'd performed to, say, in 2004? Um, there was times, there was times when I stopped, when I, when I, I would stop drinking and I would, I would, you know, the likes of when the breeze, the breeze come along, I was, I was, I was riding to a very high level. The only thing that I'd say is that I wasn't, I wasn't as light as I was back in 2004. I think I may have only been doing around about nine stone, you know, but a few years previous to that I was doing about eight, nine, eight, ten, mm. but I kind of let me wake go gradually creep up and they were for sort of different reasons it wasn't to do it yeah. not trying alcohol or whatever you know I let me way creep up to nine stone for different reasons when it rains it pours so yeah. you've just come through the fall you you've had the addiction you're talking about becoming alcohol dependent uh, you were the subject of an ongoing inquiry uh, from the, the BHA um, so what sort of pressure, what sort of day-to-day -day difficulties did you have to put aside when you sat on a horse to ride a race? Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was very, very difficult because, you know, look at this. And when, you, when you see what's faced ahead of you, if you're found guilty, you could lose your licence for one year to ten years. And, you know, I always maintained that I was, I was you know, I, I was innocent. I'd never, I never... Denied and um, passed on information. I, I did pass in information, but it wasn't for any gain back then, you know. 
it was it was just a normal thing. I, everybody always asked, um, and I think I think it would be probably ten or eleven horses that there was investigated. It was only phone contact to one of the jockeys, two or three of those occasions. There wasn't every day, and um, I was deemed guilty because I had that association with another jockey, but also because I was alcohol dependent and and I was vulnerable, you know. But this was after this happened like in two thousand and six, I think it was. But in two thousand and seven, you were found guilty. Yeah, but these were for horses in two thousand and one or two thousand and two. Was yeah. before the accident, yeah. and I wasn't alcohol dependent at that particular time. It was only documented in the papers. But the alcohol dependency was quoted in the guilty verdict. Yeah, yeah, pretty pretty much. Yeah. So did you have that hanging over you for if you say these races were two thousand and three? 2007, so we obviously knew it was ongoing. Yeah. So that was hanging over you as well as everything else. Yeah, as well as everything else, and then, you know, and I, you know, and I, have, I had a daughter at the time, and I was fighting my access through the courts to to see her, and I was I had a, I had so much go I had so much going on in my life at the time, you know, and because I I'm a person that like I have quite a lot of pride. I don't like to pick up the phone and ask for help, but I have had people, you know, that offered help and I didn't I didn't take it because only because, of, because I, of your pride yeah yeah and, and I think because you know me I mean a very independent person you know it's, it's how I was brought up and how I lived lived my life you we're know to, we're talking 10 12 years ago I don't think mental health and those type of pressures were really understood back then certainly in racing were they no I they think, weren't I think no. now it's a yeah. different kettle of fish it's a it's more widely talked about and there's not so much of a stigma is there no and i think there's more education with the young jockeys coming through with mental mm. health and it's more publicized whereas back then it, you know back then it wasn't because we've wasn't been really. friends for 20 years and a half of what you've told me i had no idea and during that period i can't believe when i look back at your stats and stuff you were still riding group winners and riding at a, a high level i think i found it surprising that you were going through this not coping clearly not coping but still performing at a, at a high level hmm. but um yeah it's 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 interesting so it feels like all that time uh, you know I, I only i can only tell you what i'm hearing but it sounds like you're just walking around with massive weight on your shoulders a number of different things are yeah. weighing you down yeah when did things start to become a little bit lighter you know did the fact that you'd been found guilty you'd served a year's ban did that kind of put one thing to bed, help you feel a little bit more comfortable that you can move on? Yeah, I mean, even though I got the year ban, I, I, I looked at it not, not as a negative thing, I looked at it as a positive, and I thought, well, it's a year out, I've had a hell of a lot going on in my life in a you know, short space of time in my career. And um, at the time I looked at it as a positive thing, but I didn't, it ended up being a negative. I didn't do positive things, you know, really, apart from drinking and going out and did you get a bit, a bit out of control in that year yeah 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 I would I would say so definitely when I look back now it's you know I would say just a bit out of control right I was you know mm. for instance you know I went I was out in York one evening and um, we all came out of a nightclub and two jockeys was walking along the bridge and they were saying oh he will jump in for a hundred quid and they were joking and I said I'll jump in for nothing he says, oh, I bet you you wouldn't. <laughs> so I stripped down to my boxer shorts at 3 o'clock in the morning on Newell's Bridge. And I looked down at the heart, and no way I would jump down there. It was the middle of the winter, and uh, the police turned up. And they're walking along the bridge and said, come down, sir. And I says, I'm going to come down now. But one of them went to grab me. But my reaction was I just jumped. And halfway down, before I hit the water, I thought, bloody hell, what have I done? You know, and... Just, I remember it's just that. Silly, I remember you know, that. Just silly things like that, and that was just alcohol fueled. And then you're trying to out swim the yeah. uh, police boat, didn't you? <laughs> well, what happened was I, I come back into shore, and the police were waiting, and everybody's filming and shouting. And as I was coming in, I just splashed the police, and I dived back in again. <laughs> you should you should have been swimming yeah. at the Olympics yeah, when yeah, you did that yeah, night. Yeah. The River Ouse, though, it's yeah. a fast flowing, dangerous river. Yeah, it's been it's been a lot of people killed you know in recent years but it's just stupidity you know Com yeah. combination of Tom Daly and Michael Phelps and one yeah. yeah yeah so so how did you get out of your slump um I don't know I think it, the slump carried on for a, a couple of years after really you know so I had the year suspension I come back and I try to give it as much as I could 
and I think I rode about 60 winners the year I come back after the suspension. And that just, you know, that didn't fulfill me. I was, but then I got myself out, I was riding out every day. And I got myself into a position where I was sat lying second to Ryan Moore, you know, in the championship. Mm. And um, I'd, 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 the weight was still there and, you know, I was still carrying the burden of the accident and I was drinking the alcohol and, and going through finan um, personal problems at the time. And um, I remember to this day, it was mid-season and I was riding for Alan Swimbank and one, a jockey rode from the evening before and won five lengths on a horse at Pontefract and Alan turned around and said to me, don't do what that jockey did last night. Don't win five lengths. This will win today in the horse's favour. And um, I remember going three lengths in front and there was a big screen of four long out and it looked like it was three, four lengths in front, but that was behind time. So they they right. caught up. So I was start coasting home and I got done right on the line and I got, I remember going into the steward's room, like I was, I was mortified, but I remember mm. I'm going to get a month's ban, but what a relief. I need it. And I right. went in and I held my hands up and I said, yeah, I'm guilty. Throw the book at me. I'm, I'm happy. I got a month ban and, and that was it. The rest is history. So you knew in the back of your mind you actually didn't want to be riding at that didn't, time? Didn't want to, no. Didn't want to be riding. So, yeah. So, so. Right, back in the studio here at the Friday Club, we are chatting away to Robert Winston uh, alongside Martin Dwyer. Robert, before we went to that last race, you were telling us uh, about alcohol, about drugs, all the dark places that you got into after the fall trying to come back. There was one particular incident that sticks in your mind that had a big bearing on you taking uh, drugs at the time. Yeah. What happened? Um... Well, I kind of, that year, I mean, I, I experienced different kind of drugs. It was a year out and, you know, it was, a lot of it was alcohol fueled. I was out with other jockeys and, you know, there was drugs taken, but there was one particular night and it was halfway through that suspension and I witnessed another jockey overdosing on drugs. And how he's still alive today is beyond me, but ever since that night, what I've seen, I said, Never again. Packed it in. It, and it was as easy as that to stop? Yeah. yeah. Because of the fear of what you just see? Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously when you see someone, you know, fitting on the ground so bad, you know, that the tongue is hanging out, drooling, eyes, eyes red in the socket, in the back of the head, and you just think, <sighs> when I witnessed that, I just thought, never again. So that shocked you into making yeah. that decision? Yeah, pretty much. And that with the jockey, how how did they fare after that? Were they okay? Um, well, he's still alive, that's for sure. But, oh, well, that's good. You know, but um, you know, I don't know what he's doing nowadays. But I hope that he is clean, because he won't get very ma many chances. So, know. so that was when you were suspended for the year. So that yeah. halfway through that suspension, that that shock took you to to just walk away from drugs completely. Yeah completely walk away yeah so then the second half of that year you started to plan your comeback and yeah I start I started riding out again I mean I stopped I actually stopped riding now for six months when I mm. when I say I looked at it as a positive thing to start with taking a year out it was a negative thing because I was doing all these crazy things and I think it was I looked at it as Laura gap it was like a student year out because it's like it's like being a, a college year. gap year I will go and experience the good times and yeah all of this kind of crazy stuff that happens when you're young and I did and when I look back I should have utilised it better and I should have been the new marker right now. For but the but how old are you at this stage of your life? Um, I'd say I was probably about, probably about 24, 24 or 5. So you're still very, very young. I mean, yeah. you know, you're way, way away from, you, you're only, you're only what, you moved to the UK only years, eight years prior to this happening to you. Uh, obviously, you were, had to, to leave your family behind. So, I mean, to the person that you are now, to that person then, the maturity is enormous. Yes, it is. You know, I would have loved to have been able to go through my career and, you know, not have used alcohol to sort of block certain things out what's happened in my life, you know, because I think I would have achieved a lot more. 
I would have certainly been riding out a lot more for other, other yards, you know. But at the same time, I was still very, very busy and I didn't, at the time, I didn't have to really ride out because I was getting a hell of a lot of rides. I was getting between 600 and 800 rides a year. At the time, my weight was good. And I suppose in my own, my own self belief that is that I'll stop at one day when I get a good job. That's when I'll show how good I am. And that, that opportunity never come along. Get a big job and then I'll stop and get back to the gym and I'll prove everyone that I'm actually a better rider than what I'm riding now because I knew I would have been and could have been. But it was my own sort of arrogance that didn't allow me to do that. But you, you still know? rode at that year, you saw 2009, you rode 120 winners. You were still very successful, but do you actually feel now that your career's over, that you've kind of left unfinished business? Yeah, well, I mean, after I had a, the fall at, Don, I had a fall at Doncaster the same year that Tropics was made no favour for the July Cup, and it was that week, would have been five or six years ago, mm. And I did multiple fractures on my on my, my T five and T six, and um, I think things sort of after then things when things started to go downhill. That's you know that's when yeah. I knew. But you're underplaying a bit because you rode a massive amount of big winners after after that. I mean, some of the, I'm looking at a list of. Yeah. I think we've got a few races to show. Well, I mean, uh, one of the things that obviously those difficult times we 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 have talked about it quite a bit and all the addiction the awful scenes that you saw at first hand but you did come back you did uh, get back into the saddle and ride at a very high level perhaps not the level that you felt that you once would uh, but the, and there were people that helped you along the way i think Barry Hills is someone that you've mentioned as uh, someone that you know helped in that in that particular uh, recovery yeah um, after the accident, after the year off, so Michael Stowe, he, he invited me back down to ride out, mm. you know, but in the, in the meantime, Ryan was getting a lot of the rides for Sir Michael. Yeah. He was a young up and coming jockey, brilliant, brilliant talent. And, you know, Ryan was, you know, he's very quiet, whereas I sort of had a different image after what happened. And it was only just one of those circumstances where, you know, Ryan was, he got, offered the first job mm. and I was riding out there and there was other jockeys getting other rides so the opportunities became a lot slimmer yeah and I was walking to Newmarket one afternoon into the owners and trainers and I bumped into Mr Hills and he was asking where I was I living and was I still up north and I said no I'm living in East Ilsley which was you know obviously 20 minutes from Lambourne yeah. Yeah. he says come and ride out and I said, well, I'm riding now for Sir Michael at the minute and Newmarket, and, you know, I feel that sort of opportunities have dried up a bit there. And um, he says, well, come and ride out and see how you go. And I took the opportunity and became second jockey to, to Michael at the time. Yeah. And, you know, it was like a, it was like a set, it was like a, another lifeline, basically, yeah. for me, you know, and, and we had a great association and a great relationship and still do. Yeah, there was some... Tremendous success. Uh, there was Prime Defender in the Duke of York Stakes, which we can show you. Uh, so, uh, during these moments, are you are you thinking, well, I'm I'm getting there. I'm I'm nearly back to my best. Or are you thinking I'm I'm not really at my best, but I'm on good horses? Yeah, I mean, I would say I was always ninety percent of the way there. You know, especially when I look, I was riding now. You know, for Mr. Hills, two or three mornings a week, maybe four at the time. I was fit. I was still doing a really good way. And you know, I, I was, I was in a good place there at the time, you know, um, and I was, I was, I was taking every opportunity that come my way, mm. and grabbing it with both hands. But you put that down to your relationship with Barry Hill, because you've always, you've always got on him really well, haven't you? Kind of, as opposed to not just a, a jockeying trainer, you've always got on well and had conversations with him regularly, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, for sure, you know, and. Even when Mr. Hills, when he was poorly, you know, uh, you know, he he often rang me himself when he was in hospital just to kill a bit of time, and it was it was great, you know, speaking to him, and mm. he, he he helped me enormously along the way, and I got great advice from him, you know. But all the years riding, when we went to Mr. Hills, I mean, I learned so much from him, you know. He's he's old school, yeah, you know. 
Um, Could have been a mentor you've needed all along. Yeah, yeah, it was, and you know, I, was, I highly respected him. He gave me he gave me opportunities where they were very slim at the time. Mm. You know, uh, Red Jazz won in the same year, won the Challenge Stakes at Newmarket, uh, almost almost uh, nine years ago to the day uh, that you were aboard him. What were the memories of that success? Look, it was it was great. I got the opportunity and a real good horse. He finished, you know, he finished third in a Group One to Rip Van Winkle, is what I can remember. Um, I don't think Ma Michael might have been banned that day, or he might have had to travel abroad somewhere. Mm. To you know, I'm not quite sure. I was given the opportunity, and the same again. I, I grabbed the you know the opportunity with both hands, and we, the horse won. And I was very appreciative of it, you know, to be given that chance. So at, at this point. You obviously you're saying you're doing quite well. What are, what are the issues away from riding that you feel might still have been bothering you? Just just per, perhaps a mental scar still that's still hovering yeah. over your head. Yeah, you know, from time to time. Look, as I said, you know, when you when you're reliving sort of accidents like that. I mean, I was in a good place then, actually. You know, then I was, as I said, I was kept busy, focused. I was doing a decent way. Um, it was only from time to time I was having the sort of flashbacks going mm. to post and. Especially on the gaff, gaff tracks when you're 16 runners around Brighton or you know, Folkestone or something like that and you're drawing six uh, on the uh, inside. Are, so you, are you still drinking? No, no, completely. Yeah, yeah. I, I will have it, a drink on, on, on occasion. Sorry, uh, this is obviously in 2010, at this time where you're riding for Barry. You, you've got the, the drinking under control now? Yeah, yeah, right. completely. Yeah, but you completely. say you're still having flashbacks to the fall and things like that. Was there anybody you were talking to, anybody helping you on the mental side of things oh. do you have anyone to talk to yeah well therapy i went and had therapy for privately therapy on your own yeah you're, you're, yeah this is all from you you're the one who's instigated this yeah so i went and got to a therapist probably five or six years ago yeah. and had numerous sessions and it worked probably for a week or two and then then they would they would resume back the flashbacks. Yeah. See, yeah. we're really lucky now. I mean, the, the PJA, they, they, they pay for a, a line which is open for any jockeys, apprentices to ring if they have mental health issues. And it, it, is, it is working and being well used and well mm. supported. But back then, there was none of that really, was there? No. But in fairness, I mean, I would like to say the PJA have been brilliant to me in, in like in the last, you know, five years because they, they did pay some of the therapy that I had, did have from a lady over near Didka. Um, you know, and then I've had, you know, I've had another little stint in rehab this year, which wasn't documented, but thanks to the PJA, so. And and that stint that you had in rehab this year, was that a contributing factor to the decision to, to call it a day? Yeah, pr yeah, pretty much. You know, I think it was, look, it was, I knew that the opportunities had dried up. Um, I wasn't getting the opportunities I once was. I'd lost the rides on the breeze of breeze and, you know, the Tony Bloom horses only through the change in management and from here on in I actually couldn't see another good horse coming along and it, it just I was hoping to get to the end of the year but I couldn't mm. I couldn't cope with it I couldn't you know I couldn't keep maintaining it because prior to Le Brise Breeze there when he came along uh, there's lots of chat eventually when he came along and you were winning on him that you had said Do you know what if it wasn't for this horse I'd have called it a day before then. So, what was the mindset? Where are you? What's what are you thinking about then? Before Le, just before La Brisa Breeze comes along, um, I gave me notice to Dean that year in January because I'd like to say, Mr. Yarrow, um, Michael and Hedda Yarrow, they're one of Dean's main owners. They, I mean, they gave me a really good opportunity in the last five years riding for them, and I built up a really good association and relationship with them and with Dean. And that sort of kept me going for so long. Mm. But when you don't have like a group one horse, it's you know, it's, it's you know, and then rides are starting to drive. You're struggling with your weight, and you lose sort of lose momentum. But I lost. I started to lose momentum since the Doncaster fall a few years back. Right. And then it's just gradually kept gra p catching up with me, and you know. So that was two year, two years ago, was it? The fall of Doncaster. Yeah. Now it would have been about five years ago. Oh, that far back. So, so the Doncaster yeah. fall has only added to Just, yeah. the scars, really, yeah. and, and, and added to the weight of issues that you had with the flashbacks, etc. Was that what was happening? Yeah, that yeah, pretty much, yeah. Up until, and I, and I was sort of still on and off, you know, using alcohol to get through the days, the stressful days, and, you know, and 
my weight wasn't my weight wasn't great, but at, at that particular time, but I was in a visit. I was in a sort of mentality where I didn't really care because I knew my time was coming to an end. Really, right. but I was just pushing and trying to hold on to what I had, you know, because it's been my life for twenty three yeah. years. It, I didn't want to let go, but I think when you when you when it's affecting your family life and your kids and you know you have to you have to think right enough uh, enough is enough and I was going to ask yeah. you about that because obviously that's a very personal thing and you don't have to talk about it if you don't want to but all the way all the way you've spoken about obviously yourself but there are people around you which is something that we don't often think about because we only know the the principles you know whether it's Robert Winston Martin Dwyer whoever it is Frank Vittori we don't often think about the people closest to them who are affected so you mentioned your daughter a while back, you know, she was young when obviously uh, you had the accident, etc. I mean, was it easy to maintain the role of being a father through all these issues that you're having? Um, no, not really. It's been, it's been tough. I mean, the daughter, that I, she's 15 you now, she lives in New York from a previous relationship, whereas my current partner, fiance now, Victoria, we've got two children. You know, Lily's seven and Joe, he's four. And has, I think it's been tough on them the last three or four years, you know, you know, seeing their dad struggling with his way, drinking excessively, um, being grumpy, moody, you know. It's, when they hear, like, the, you know, the dad, this has only happened the last few years, sort of eating, the tea with them, then going back and vomiting, and then to pick up on it, and it's affecting them. And then you just, you know, everything sort of, hmm. you have to look out for their best interest as well, you know, as well as my own health as well. So yeah. that played a part on your final decision, yeah. the impact it was having on your family. Yeah, yeah, it was having a, it was having a massive impact on them, hmm. y you know. And because you're li in racing, you're just, you're just living in this, bubble and you're self-consumed mm. about your day-to-day -day job and you're wasting and you're traveling in the car and you speak to owners and everyone thinks oh he's a great fella he's lovely but mm. you go home and you'd be in a bad mood because you'd be up because you've obviously been up right now you're tired and I'm all right I'm never in a bad mood my wife yeah. can testify to her oh. never I don't I don't I don't believe that she she was very keen for you to return to the Friday Club is all I'm going to say <laughs> but we have had you know messages from fellow professionals uh, who have been saying is Rachel Neller, for example, says uh, anybody thinking jockeys have an easy life should watch the interview. Um, you know, uh, Callum Shepherd has said uh, if the phrase "you never know what's going on behind closed doors" could ever be shown to be more apparent, uh, it's quite remarkable what Robert was able to achieve consistently going through what he did. I mean, Martin, as a fellow professional, you know, Callum's sentiment about, and you've kind of touched on it. You know, he he has achieved an enormous amount but he's not the only one out there doing this I mean obviously he's achieved a, a pretty decent level there are others who are going through the same doing it at a slightly lower level which could arguably is even harder because at least Robert was had the reputation I guess but what what must the problem be like out there for it's um I've, as we've already touched on it I wouldn't say it's easier now, but it's it's more understood, that certainly the mental health issues, and there's a lot more support there, and there's no stigma attached. When Robert was going through 10, 15 years ago, mm. I mean, for me, he always tried too hard to prove he, he wasn't suffering, and that was hard for him, but I've known him for 20 years, and I see there's there's a shift in the culture now. A lot of the, yeah. our generation retiring, the young lads coming through, they wouldn't know Robert so well, because he's been so quiet for the last <laughs> few years. Yeah. Oh, you've just yeah. been getting on, and nobody really, nobody really knew you were probably suffering in silence. Yeah, mm. I was really. I was, I was suffering in silence. I mean, I'd sit in, I'd sit in the corner, I'd sit on my peg, and I'd read the farm, and just keep myself to myself. I, yeah. I, the last latter years, I was never, you know, sort of involved in the camaraderie and the joke, and I was just go, going there, getting my job done, just mm. seeing it as an income, pay the mortgage, pay my bills, and you know, and get through the day, you know, but. But I, I mean, I do see there is a lot of there is a lot of troubled jockeys out there. Yeah. And since I've retired from riding, you know, I have had plenty ring me, and I know exactly what they're going through as well. So, you know. <laughs>
Robert Winston, Martin Dwyer alongside me in the Friday Club studio. Uh, Robert, we've talked about a lot of dark times for you, a lot of tough times, um, extremely insightful and revealing. But let's talk about some, some magical moments. And there's a grey horse called Labrisa Breeze, who I'm sure is very, very close to your heart. Uh, you won the British champion sprint on him on Champions Day at Ascot uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, quite magnificent, the, the way this horse improved through the handicaps. But you can talk us through what this was like winning on Champions Day. Yeah, look, he had obviously had the soft ground that day. There was a really strong pace. and Strong field as well. Strong field, you know. The Tin Man and Harry Asia, Angel, yeah, yeah, you know, and um, look, he's a, he's a, he's a horse that actually thrives when he gets to Ascot for some reason. That last falling up that hill, he takes off, um, and everything just fell right for him on the day. Going into the race, we knew he had a big chance because his his walk had been really good. I uh, sat on him a week before, mm. went down to Dean's, and I never had to feel off a horse like. And I said to Dean, "That's it, he's ready." No more walk. He's, he's keep the lid on it. Yeah. Dean did exactly that, you know, yeah. and, and produced him and got him there in tip-top shape on the day. Um, and what did it mean to you to be back in the the Group One winners' enclosure again? It was a big relief because what he did was he proved me right. Because from day one I said he was a Group One horse. From the moment I sat on him, you know. When Dean and showed me his pedigree, his form, when he first got him, I looked at it. I actually looked and I says, "Oh, he could be a John Smith's Magna Cup, because he was second over a mile and yeah. one in his previous start there at York." And um, when I sat on him, I just thought, "This horse is a, this horse has got speed that I've never sat on before." He was lighting the gallops up, yeah, you know. And um, that was it. He he won at a mile. I think that was his start off run at Wolverhampton. But and then he he's mapped out then for the Royal Hunt Cup. But unfortunately that. You know, that race he was he was drawn this side and he was he was drawn badly. He finished mm. second. And then I was on to the gig he set, I think it was handicap yes. at Ascot, and he was fancied enormously to win that. And when he pulled off, pulled it off. An impossible task from where he had to come from. Yeah, and did you not win a a Leicester for that? The breeze, a breeze one. It wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> he got he got me out of there. And you obviously shit. collected yeah. it on his behalf. On, on his behalf, <laughs> because he got me out of trouble. Was that for yeah. ride, of the, ride of the year? Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah so oh, that, that must have been satisfying. Yeah. Here we go. You know what, that, you, there's a leading question. No. Martin Dwyer here. Talking about Robert. Yeah. No, Good. but to win a Leicester for ride of the year, <laughs> voted for by all the other jockeys. No, yeah. but to win a Leicester for ride of the year, voted by all the other jockeys. Yeah. Is it all about you or what? Are we gonna let, yeah, we're going to let's see. But I mean, it, it was... It was one of them circumstances. I knew I was in trouble, and I knew if I moved left or right quickly yeah. and got him off balance, to, that's it. He wouldn't win. So I sat quiet and quiet and quiet until the opening come, and that was it. He, the horse was away. He just sprouted wings. Yeah. But he proved me right. He he showed. He demonstrated. He was a Group One horse on that day in a handicap. Mm. And um, but it was, it was good timing, you know, you rode him. You, you don't win a Leicester unless you've given a horse a good ride. No. I won two, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it was, it, was, it was a good teamwork from Dean, the management, you know, it was, it was great. It was great teamwork. From You're getting really well with Dean, don't you? I mean, you've had a good link up your last couple of, well, last five or six years, really, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, been yeah. Dean. I picked up a spare ride, actually, at Sandown one day, and right. it won Tequila Bay, I think it might have been called. Yeah. And um, then... I got when I was based up north. I got the call up off Dean. He put me on serious pros prospect. It was Mr. And Mrs. Yarrow's horse and yeah. Tropics, and he was a handicapper. Both horses, serious won a listed race that day, and Tropics won the feature handicap, and yeah. that's where the relationship built from there on in. You know, and he's he's one of my favourite people, Dean Irish. Do you know why? In one interview with Nick Luck, he referred to Nick as Rishi three times. <laughs> yeah. Um, really? And I could see Lucky smirking on each occasion that he mentioned. He said, "Well, Rishi, let me tell you about this horse." And Nick carried on, and he carried on the interview. And on the third time, <laughs> Nick, you know how Lucky holds the mic and he does it. And then on the third time, Lucky did one of those <laughs> yeah. uh, in absolute disgust. And in fairness, uh, afterwards, uh, 
Dean said to Nick, I think I called you the wrong name, didn't I? <laughs> Lucky pretended to laugh it off and then came storming into the uh, Couldn't to wait the to tell you. Yeah. said, you never yeah. prove yeah. with yeah. He's Dean such a gentle yeah, yeah, he's, he? he's so easy to, to deal with, so easy to go on. He's a great friend of mine and, you know, I'm going to, you know, look at him, miss riding from enormously. He's one of the most easiest guys to, to ride for. You know, he leaves it to the jockey, to your profession. He'll ask you what you think and the jockey will tell him. And then he'll say what he thinks of the horse and mm. you kind of work it together. But um, but he's a very good listener, Dean. When you come back with feedback, he listens. And he'll ring you the next day and he'll say, Rob, you're right, I'm going to do this and I'm going to make a plan. And he goes, every, he goes through everything with, you know, through, with fine detail, you know. And with horses, welfare and health, he's he's right up there. He's yeah. leaves no stone unturned. You know, if you tell him a horse needs scoping, he'll scope it. Yeah. And he and he'll and he he'll ring you himself and tell you how it went, whether it was good or bad. He's he keeps very informative. He Brilliant. keeps his jockeys and his staff yeah. very informative. You know. He's always a pleasure to deal with. Uh, but obviously, you rode La Brisa Breeze in the Tony Bloom colours, and <clears throat> through that, obviously, you you rode uh, for Tony Bloom, and you rode Withhold. Uh, yeah. who, of course, turned out to be a, v a very good horse. Um, so what was the experience like riding uh, as the retained jockey for, for Tony Bloom? Did you enjoy that? Um, yeah, well, I wasn't really retained. It was just sort of like a gentleman's the manager agreement. at the time. It was right. gentleman's agreement. Things had gone very well with La Brise, Brise. They were happy. And, of course, I was given the chance on Flame and Spear, which Flame and Spear was with Kevin Ryan at the time. Mm. And he won some, a couple of nice handicaps up at Newcastle. And um, things sort of progressed from there. Then I got the leg up on withhold. The first day I rode him, I finished third. You know, so I f finished third at Newbury, a mile and a half. He, mm. he was off for quite a while, and he needed to run. And then I come to the Zazara, which where you know he was a major fancy going into that race. Yeah. And I, you know, I could have, if I really, really pushed to do the eight nine that day, I would have done. But I felt it was unfair to be wasting and not be able to give the horse. The, me, the best of my full ability at the time, so I let them carry on and, and use Sylvester, and yeah. he, you know he pulled out all the stops and won for them. You yeah. know. But you won the Northumberland Plate on him. That's right. Uh, yeah. And he, he just lobbed around in that race, didn't he? He made all, didn't you? Yeah. We, the plan was to take a lead on him, and um, but then in fairness to Mr. Charlton, you know he said he did say that um, if there was no pace, it's down to you. You're mm. the jockey. And there was no pace, I knew from the off, and then we, we just sat in front, and it was like a hack canter, and then mm. he quickened away. They're the Quite, best instructions, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, just leave it to you, you know, do what you think is best. Especially with a you know, more experienced jockey. Yeah. You know. So, <clears throat> just just give us a, a little bit of a, a insight into your thought process over the last 12 months, where things have sort of Got, the, got to a stage where you feel the rides are drying up, the good horses, the rides on the good horses are drying up, and the battle to do all the things that you've done on a daily basis, you feel really not worth it anymore. Yeah, we're having the Tony Bloom job. I was, I was getting up in the morning, you know, I was, I was, I'd been riding out for Charlie Hills and through Barry on a regular basis, and they were, they've been paying me to do it, and I've, I was very appreciative of taking the job because I was getting very well paid from Charlie and Barry. And um, I was really enjoying it. I had a really good routine right mm. now, three or four days a week, and you know, having a chat with the boss and Charlie, and they have a great bunch of staff. And, um, you know, unfortunately, because Dean was, a, was an hour and a half away from me, I was only dropping down on a regular basis. Mm. I became then so I committed to looking to the future ahead with our new business that we were setting up myself and my fiancé. Yeah. needed to be close at the home, but then I had myself getting well paid from Mr. Hills right now, and, you know. And um, I was hoping to get another two, stretch another two or three years riding, and the good horses were keeping me going. And come to the new year, and I knew that wasn't going to happen. I knew a lot of the management positions changed in the Bloom camp, and. The writing was on the writing was on the wall, and you know that was. I knew, pretty. I'd say it was Jan end of January. February time, I knew I knew that you know, my career was coming to an end unless another top class horse come, and what I couldn't see it happening. See that 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 is 
the, the, there's that romantic element though in racing, isn't there? You, you know, I mean, it's 10 years since See the Stars won the arc and Mick and Nan mm. kind of hung around for him. Yeah. Even someone like him, you, you, you still wait for the potential to ride that one good horse. I mean, to keep it, you going. Yeah, it's very difficult for, yeah. for people like us who, who've never sat well, we on We chatted horse, quite a lot in the last couple of years because, as Robert was saying, yeah. he's coming to the end and, and you, th those good horses will keep me going. I, I do remember when La Brise of Brise won at Ascot, I thought Winston's finally gone mad. Because when he won, he said, with the prize money, he's buying a tractor. <laughs> oh, he said he didn't him, know what I meant. I said, yeah. yes, he's gone mad, he's buying a tractor. <laughs> and um, obviously, he had in his mind setting up this new business he set up with uh, Vicky yeah. um, in uh, Didcot, is it? Didcot? Yeah, well, Chilton, just out of Didcot. Yeah. Yeah, so. So, so just to, what, what is the business? You were saying earlier that you know, horses come there, you can do anything with them. Racehorse, well, we set up in Pelequines, racehorse rehabilitation. So we've taken on entry horses. We've had people like Dennis Coakley and Eric Wheeler send us horses, but our main two trainers is Charlie Hills and Roger Teal. Mm -hmm. And we need to thank them enormously for the support that we're receiving from them. And it's, you get great pleasure just seeing these horses torn up and they're in top nick mm. and you've got beautiful horses and you've got to you've got to put a bit more meat in them and make them look even better going yeah. back because they want to see them horses gleaming and it's been going really well and they've right. been very very happy with the horses going yeah. back and we've been getting more support from them and we, 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 we you know we're boarding some brood mares now for a couple of owners and yeah. we have an owner from dean's you know go in and um it's you know, it's just it's just going from strength to strength, really, and yeah. I'm really enjoying it. I'm probably walking harder now, more yeah. than what I was. Well, I rang now. you one morning last week, and he was in the paddock doing something, and he was grafting away. But I've never heard you so happy for years. Yeah. Pill picking is therapeutic, so anyone who says it's not, it is. <laughs> I mean, I spent but you're doing it, every day. You're doing I mean, it for yourself, your own business, and you've got something. And like you yeah. say, you had the foresight a couple of years ago. You won a big, you won a Group One Ascot. We just seen that, and the prize money gone straight into buying a tractor for the mm. new business so you know fair play to you. you've got out on your terms you've got something for the future you've it's been very a... candid tonight Robert you know you've, you've talked about a lot of things that uh, for a lot of people wouldn't have known about before so okay yes you're, you're retired now uh, you can pretty much say whatever you want but that's not the only reason why you've been so candid we were chatting a few minutes ago, and the thing that struck me was the fact that you said you perhaps couldn't tell people in the past when you were riding, because you were worried about people yes. judging you. Just yeah, just worried about being judged. It's like even with the drug issue, I think I probably mentioned it in a uh, an over the phone interview at the races. That's the only time I'd ever mentioned it in my whole career, my whole life. But now I feel I can open up because you know there there is a big problem where at the moment, and we, we see jockeys being banned recently and um, it's, you know it's more of a problem than we think but it's, there's obviously underlying issues with the you know with the workload of jockeys with the waste and the pressures of being jocked off racing has changed you know you you've, if you don't have a stable job you're very lucky to stay on the same horse twice and mentally it affects jockeys you know coming through and it's, it's, it's very, it is very very tough sport you know it is and even 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 the jockeys at the top it's tough for them because when they're there at the top it's staying there, it's tough staying there, you know. There's a lot of knocks even though you are at the top of your game. Do you feel that you can you can help? Well, yeah, I mean, since I sort of packed in, I, you know, retired from the saddle. Um, I have had jockeys, you know, Colin, and, and I, I've been open and explained to the reasons why I stopped and they were like, they, they ha they're having similar, you know, issues mentally, hmm. being jocked off, not getting the rides, not certainly with drugs or anything like that, but mentally, you know, it's, it's jockeys being affected. Martin, do you think that someone like Robert could do a lot of positive work in the weighing room, the way things stand now? I know you're saying that they're better now than they were 10, 12 years ago, but they still, there are people out there that need help. Yeah, definitely, because it, it just goes to show that there's no stigma attached and everybody suffers from time to time with certain issues and Robert coming out and being so open and honest tonight has really shown people because he's you know, he's a tough lad and always has been throughout his career and, uh, you know, everybody has weaknesses and struggles with the pressure that are on jockeys, especially young jockeys coming through and, and Robert's in a good situation because he's, he's been through many problems and come out the other side. So 
hopefully it can uh, inspire young lads to come out and talk about it. Yeah, it, it is tough for it's tough for jockeys because if you feel that you're being judged, like if I I, look, I could never open like, up like this if I, if I was riding today because there is people that will judge it and there's people you you will lose rides because of it. I mean, for last rides because of the year suspension, it's you know it's just how it is, you know. And um, but no, I feel I feel there's been a, a big weight lifted out my shoulders and a dark cloud gone since I've mm. hung my boots up. Do you think racing does enough now though to support people in? De yes, definitely. Look, the PJA are brilliant. I mean, they have a they have a helpline there. I mean, I've I've spoken to the to them a couple of times in the last the last year. You know, I, I had a fall up at Newcastle in January. It was only a light, simple fall. And driving home that night, I knew something wasn't quite right. I started getting pins and needles all down my arm. But what I did was I turned up at Chems for the next night to ride. And I was sat there, my arm, my, my arm went heavy, and I thought, I'm not right. So I seen a doctor, and then Jerry Hilger on the phone said, we'll have to sign you down, you can't ride this evening. So then I had some neck scans done. So I got some osteophyte bars in, in my neck where it was blocking the nerves. So that reason why I was getting the pins and needles. So. I, at five or six, seven weeks out of a lot of therapy over in Oxy House, I was actually with Fran Berry doing a lot of therapy with him oh. at the same time. Yeah. Well, that'll make you want to get back to the saddle. <laughs> and you know what? I was I was in a really good. I was in. I was. I was in a good place, getting fit and strong mentally. And yeah. and then after I got back riding, back to the sweating and wasting, and I, I think because it's been rel relentless, the suffering over the years. Mm. I, when I look back now, I'd say I probably had probably a bit of a mental breakdown. So I went a bit crazy drinking. It was affecting family life, children. Mm. I rang the PJ in. You know, they, they were they were there to help, and they they got me into rehab for four weeks. And um, I think I, that was around about April of this year. Yeah. And um, I packed in. I was finished. I even the, even there when I was in rehab, I was I felt the best I'd never felt before. Yeah. And I was no wasting i was went up to nine stone 12 i think i was in there and i was training five days a week i was strong feeling good I come out of there back to the no i come out of there feeling great i was finishing it and then my agent rang the, that day and said kinren is in the victoria cup on saturday mr baron wants you to ride it and i was on the phone and i said just i looked at victoria and says i'm gonna ride this horse because i think highly of him and he's got a chance of winning and I took the ride and I thought, I'll just see how it goes. He finished second and he sort of gave me another lifeline. But then, but then after things, after that, then things yeah. were starting to get bad again. And I had to, for me to save me health, my family, every, everyone around me, you know, mental health, everything, I had yeah. to, that's why I had to sort of, you know, call it a day. <laughs>